I'll be talking about an archaeological project that some Mammoth students and I have been working on uh, for the last, uh, last several years. And it was inspired by earlier work on uh, the Philadelphia Lazaretto by David Barnes, who's a historian uh, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania and by folks working in the Historic Preservation Program also at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's titled Fever, the History and Archaeology of the Philadelphia Lazaretto Quarantine Hospital Precursor to Ellis Island. And uh, tonight's presentation is really an archaeological exploration of an important but somewhat uh, overlooked and forgotten historic site, Philadelphia Lazaretto, which you see here. And this is a site that reflects uh, a critical period in the development of urban public health in the young United States. Uh, and the presentation really tries to highlight how archaeology and the study of material remains can provide a venue for re-examining aspects of our shared history that have been forgotten or overlooked. And it's particularly relevant right now as we are uh, quarantined and socially distancing um, because this is uh, a hospital that was built as a response to a public health crisis. So let's start uh, with a poem. Uh, Hot dry winds forever blowing, dead men to the graveyards going, constant hearses, funeral verses, oh what plagues there is no knowing, nature's poisons here collected, water, earth, and air infected, oh what a pity such a city was in such a place erected. Uh, the poem is titled Pestilence. Uh, happily, kids don't have to read this in high school English courses. It was written by Philip Freneau, who was sometimes called the poet of the American Revolution. Uh, he was actually from Matawan, New Jersey, and he wrote it in response to Philadelphia's 1793 yellow fever epidemic. And that was a plague that took the lives of over 5,000 of the city's roughly 45,000 inhabitants. Some 17,000 people fled the city. And this is an image of what Philadelphia would have looked like at the time, including George Washington, then president of the United States. At the time, the cause of yellow fever was unknown. Uh, the disease went by many names. It was called Yellow Jack and Bronze John. And it occurred with a disturbing regularity in the coastal cities of Eastern North America. It was first recorded in the Americas in 1647 on the island of Barbados, an English colony. And the, de the disease's progression was well known. After an incubation period of three to six days, headache, chills, fever, nausea, and vomiting would all occur. Some individuals, today estimated to be about 15% of cases, then would enter what was considered a toxic phase where you'd get jaundice from liver damage, uh, there'd be bleeding from the mouth, eyes, the gastrointestinal tract, vomiting of blood, uh, and kidney failure. Today, uh, yellow fever still exists. Uh, it is uncommon, certainly in North America. The overall fatality rate today is about 5%. That number seems to have been much higher in the 18th century. Uh, survivors uh, had lifelong immunity. So if you survived yellow fever, you were good. The 1793 Philadelphia yellow fever epidemic began in the spring. Uh, the cause of it is not entirely clear. Uh, it may have been uh, transmitted uh, from refugee ships coming into the port of Philadelphia uh, following revolutions in the Caribbean. Water carried on those ships uh, may have allowed mosquitoes to breed, and those mosquitoes which were carrying the disease uh, then spread out into the city. And this is a nice uh, GIS map um, by Billy Smith at Montana State University that shows how yellow fever deaths uh, moved through the city. Other folks have attributed um, the disease to other vessels coming into the city. Philadelphians at the time uh, actually thought that the cause might have been a spoiled cargo of coffee that had been dumped on the docks. It apparently smelled awful, and, and they thought that might have been a problem. Physicians differed considerably in how they thought uh, they should respond to the disease. 
Benjamin Rush, seen here in a painting, and Benjamin Rush is like the Dr. Oz of the 18th century. Everyone knew Benjamin Rush. He advocated heroic medicine, and heroic medicine would have included bleeding uh, and purging in, in order really to get the human body back into balance. Uh, other physicians advocated less drastic measures. Uh, one of his uh, competitors uh, advocated fresh air and vinegar baths. Um, the, the honest truth is uh, bleeding, purging, fresh air and vinegar baths all would have been ineffectual against uh, yellow fever. The illness is caused by a virus. Uh, that virus is spread by the bite of a mosquito, the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Uh, the disease is a hemorrhagic fever, and it's believed to have originated in East or Central Africa, spread from there. In Philadelphia, it starts out at the Arch Street Wharfs and it moves inland. And the city's uh, pretty meager medical resources, even though Philadelphia was a center for uh, the study of medicine in the United States, even during this time period, the city's pretty uh, meager medical resources were soon stretched to the breaking point. Uh, medical practices of the day were unable to combat the virus, and uh, the result was, to quote a contemporary source, and here you see a contemporary illustration, universal terror. Uh, this is sort of reminiscent of Monty Python, right, with bring out the dead. Uh, the Pennsylvania Hospital, ironically, did not admit patients suffering from infectious diseases, um, and soon, the city of Philadelphia seized the estate of a wealthy merchant, William Hamilton. Uh, his estate was called Bush Hill, and his very large house there was turned into an impromptu hospital. Hamilton himself, uh, uh, happily not at home, he was in, uh, in the UK. Again, individuals with financial means fled the city. Uh, members of Philadelphia's vibrant free African-American community uh, were pressed into service as impromptu nurses and helpmates. Um, Benjamin Rush worked with uh, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, two prominent ministers, to enlist the services of African-American residents, residents. Rush believed, and it turns out he was wrong, uh, but Rush believed that individuals of African descent had a natural immunity to the disease. Um, this supposition was ill-founded in a city where most individuals of African descent had been locally born, therefore had not been previously exposed to yellow fever. And African Americans passed away at essentially the same rate as other individuals. By late fall, the disease had subsided, although it would, it would return again in subsequent years. And the reason it subsides in the fall is because the mosquitoes are being killed off by colder weather. In 1881, uh, oh, hold on one second. Here are just uh, two, two bits of uh, physical evidence. Uh, you see a grave marker for Peter Markley, uh, which commemorates the fact that Peter died from that fatal disorder, the yellow fever, on September 11th, 1793. He was age 19. Uh, and the other image uh, shows what they would have called the table of mortality from 1798. And here we see the number of individuals in different parishes in the city who have passed, passed away. So again, the disease is recurring. It is not until 1881 that the Cuban physician, Carlos Finlay, who ironically had been trained in medicine in Philadelphia, argued correctly that yellow fever was spread by mosquitoes, an idea that was further supported by the work of US Army physician, Walter Reed, and Finlay and Reed are seen in this painting. So the 1793 yellow fever epidemic was transformative in a horrific way Philadelphia. And the city, uh, with a very active municipal government, took steps to prevent recurrence of uh, the catastrophe. And there were a number of major initiatives undertaken in the city to sort of reshape um, how the public interacted that were going on at this time. Um, for instance, 
a new waterworks was constructed to bring clean water uh, to the citizens of Philadelphia. So the waterworks is sort of in the foreground of this image and up on the hill behind it, sort of Parthenon-like, is uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. A new prison would be constructed in the early 19th century, the famous Eastern States Penitentiary, which was meant uh, to intimidate potential criminals when you look at how it is shaped very much like a castle, but also featured sort of the Quaker system and a panoptic design where individual prisoners would have their own cells. Uh, this actually stayed in use well into the 20th century, which is it's kind of amazing. So the city of Philadelphia is very interested in trying to improve conditions in the city. They also built a naval hospital. Um, and most importantly for our purposes, the Lazaretto was constructed. Um, it's constructed uh, in 1799. And in fact, my first involvement with the building uh, was taking uh, tree ring samples to see if the date commonly put forward for the date for the building's construction was correct, and, and it is correct. The samples actually lined up very nicely to 1799. Uh, you can see the original indenture or deed for the building's construction in the corner uh, of, the, of the image. It's enormous. One other thing to take in from this picture, actually there are a couple things. Uh, the little stuccoed building right in front of us is a guard house. There were a pair of those. So the whole complex, and it was a large complex, was surrounded by a fence. And that's for very obvious reasons, right? It's so that sick people can't get out and well people can't stumble in. Also, the flag is worth noting. It's a yellow flag. Uh, and if it were sort of unfurled a little bit differently, you'd see the letter Q on it. And that is a Q for quarantine to indicate to passing ships that individuals are quarantined here. And then finally, you could see a, a seaplane in the background. And we'll come back to the seaplane uh, in just a minute. So today, the Philadelphia Lazaretto, which is actually in Essington or Tinicum Township, it's 10 miles south of Philadelphia, is believed to be the oldest surviving historic quarantine station in the United States. So it's an entire complex of buildings, and in this very nice painting, you can see some of them. Uh, there are two, let's see if my mouse works, Seems to. There are two matching houses, a physician's house that still stands. It's now off the property, and a quarantine master's house. Here are those two guard houses. There would have been a dock. Uh, there's a second building back here, which is called the Dutch Hospital. I think Dutch as in Deutsch. This is constructed because there are so many ill German immigrants coming in in the mid 19th century. Uh, there would have been an incinerator, a kitchen, there are barns. Uh, again, it's a it's a holistic complex. This is not a very good reproduction, but this map shows the major buildings and some ships uh, docked off the main dock here. And here's a somewhat grainy uh, picture of the Dutch hospital at the Lazaretto. The interior of the building uh, was well appointed. The drop ceiling is obviously uh, more recent, but you can see a very nice sort of federal mantelpiece here, beautifully done, good cabinets. Um, Notice that Habs rocks, and I agree, that's a historic American building survey, which had documented the building. It has a cupola uh, on top, and you could still access it. We got actually very good timber samples from the cupola. And this would have given you a view of any ships coming up the Delaware, the Delaware River. So it played a critical uh, purpose, had a critical function in the building. So the way the Lazaretto worked is, any ship that's coming to enter the port of Philadelphia has to stop uh, at the Lazaretto and there it would be subjected to a health inspection. Uh, cargoes were inspected and anything that was rotten or problematic, um, infested with vermin, uh, would be put in an incinerator, destroyed. If individuals were deemed too ill to travel on to the city, uh, they would be quarantined until they recovered sufficiently or they passed away. Uh, and there was a substantial cemetery uh, on the property. And my favorite Lazaretto story probably deals with the precursor to this building, uh, which was actually right where the school kill comes into the Delaware. That was the first pest house or Lazaretto. Uh, and it deals with a very interesting case. You've probably heard of the Amistad case. 
this is a similar case. The U.S. Navy sloop of war named Ganges was apparently quite a vessel that had been built as a merchantman and then converted into a naval ship. Uh, captures in 1800 two American uh, slave schooners, the Phoebe and the Prudent, off the coast of Cuba with 134 captured people on board. Those two ships are brought back to Philadelphia by the Ganges for adjudication in federal court by Judge Richard Peters, uh, and they had violated the 1794 Slave Trade Act. And that law prohibited American vessels from participating in the slave trade. Judge Peters, who was sympathetic to the abolitionist cause, placed the Africans under the supervision and care of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. And those individuals actually took the surname, the last name, Ganges. Uh, they had hoped to be returned to Africa. Uh, they were not. Uh, instead, they were indentured to families in the Philadelphia region. Um, and some of them still live in the greater Philadelphia region and still carry uh, the last name Ganges. And we believe, just because of when this is happening, right, our Lazaretto goes up in 1799, this is 1800, our building may not be complete. We think this is actually happening at the, the previous Lazaretto, which was in Philadelphia, which was a real problem. Um, however, we know that some individuals from this group actually uh, lived and stayed at the 1799 Lazaretto in Kinnickin Township. So the Lazaretto continues to function uh, throughout the 19th century, and here are a number of newspaper articles uh, really spanning the whole century uh, and showing that people are being taken to the Lazaretto. You'll notice uh, they talk about the season, almost like a fishing season, and really it's those warm weather months when they're most concerned with quarantining individuals. Finally, in 1895, um, the city of Philadelphia gets out of uh, the business of quarantining individuals coming to the city and the state of Pennsylvania takes over these responsibilities and they build a new quarantine station on the Delaware at Marcus Hook, which you can see in this postcard. An athletic club uh, called the Orchard Club uh, purchases the buildings of the Lazaretto. And here you can see folks playing lawn tennis. It looks quite bucolic. Uh, and it turned it, they turned the site into their clubhouse. In 1915, the Lazaretto becomes a seaplane base. Pretty cool. One of the first in the United States. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, it still functions as a seaplane base. So if you have a seaplane, I don't know anyone who does, but if you do, uh, you could fly into the Lazaretto, and people did while we were excavating there, which was really, really cool. Um, by the early 20th century, um, actually, I have one more photo. This shows uh, soldiers lined up on the Lazaretto property during World War One. So it serves this military function during the First World War. But after the First World War, uh, it is largely abandoned. Uh, it is documented twice by the Historic American Building Survey, first in the 1930s, and this is a nice 1933 photograph. Here's another one from 1933. And then again in 1972, and by the 1970s, much of the property was being used uh, for boat storage. There was one previous archeological investigation, uh, and this was because a very large, uh, firehouse complex is being constructed, um, which is related to a, well, which is shown in outline right here. Uh, that project stayed away from the Lazaretto building proper, but looked at the yard areas. Uh, it involved some radar and some trenching. Uh, the results of the work there um, are, are pretty minimal. They, didn't, they don't provide a lot of information about what they found. So in 2015, uh, Monmouth began its project after discussions with, with David Barnes. Uh, these are two other important images. One is a, a lock on a door there that shows uh, the symbol that was used throughout the quarantine uh, facility, which is the key to the city of Philadelphia and balance it and a scale at the top or balance, right? So should we let you in or not? And um, 
the cemetery that was once on the site is believed to have been moved. Uh, and this is a, a marker uh, commemorating the individuals at Mount Zion Cemetery in Philadelphia who were moved from the quarantine station. So in 2015, though, we begin our project. This is what the property looked like when we got there. Um, we've started out by gathering as much historical information as we could. This is a nice early map. And I think what's fun about this is here's the Lazaretto and the customs house. And you'll notice Philadelphia would be off to the right. This is really sparsely settled. There's nothing going on here. And that's pretty purposeful, right? They wanna be out of the city center. Uh, here are two uh, 19th century maps, 1850s and 1870s. There are again the Lazaretto complex. Here it is. Uh, it's fun to note Governor Prince State Park is right next to it. Governor Prince is, uh, was one of the Swedish governors of New Sweden, and he lived in a house called the Prince Hop that archaeologists uh, Donald Kadzow in the 1930s and more recently Marshall Becker, I think, in the 1980s have excavated. It's a site that would date back to the 1600s. And actually there's a very strong Native American occupation there as well. One of the things that challenged us when we did our project is that uh, there were these sort of miniature railroads, light gauge rail all over the place. And these had been put in to move around seaplanes and later boats. So the ground uh, was very much disturbed in the area between the Lazaretto itself uh, and the river's edge. Interesting enough, this is a public archaeology project. So we were working with the Friends of the Lazaretto and people from Tinicum Township and trying to be uh, good partners. We said, you know, what would be interesting to you? What would you like us to look for? And they said, oh, well, what we're really interested in is uh, where the foundations are for the porch. From an archaeological perspective, I did not think that was the sexiest thing to look for, but that's what they wanted. Uh, and they showed us this photo, not in great shape, but we could see this beautiful porch that had been there. And uh, we started shovel testing with the help of local volunteers. And here we are documenting that. And we were very successful. We found porch supports uh, regularly spaced along the front of the building. Um, one of them actually had some Native American artifacts in with it. That was kind of cool. Now the Physician's house still stands, but it's on a piece of property that's been cut off. So here it is. Uh, the other thing that the folks from Tinicum Township said would be really, really cool would be to find the quarantine master's house. And we knew that this had burned uh, during the First World War um, when a bunch of uh, pilots, uh, perhaps having too much fun drinking, uh, started a fire in a building and it was lost. So uh, we, we knew about where it should be because the uh, property was very nicely nicely laid out. Um, as, you'll, as you see from the picture though, the area is like it's gravel paving, it's horrific. And I have a bunch of you know 18 and 19 year olds with me digging and I'm trying to convince them to become archeologists. So uh, a little bit of pecking at this with a shovel was very, very frustrating. And we said to our, our partners from Tinicum Township, you know, you really need to do this with a backhoe and sort of a professional uh, not not with us. And, um, and they said, oh, we could get a backhoe. And, and one appeared about 15 minutes later. And uh, one of our volunteers, Andy Martin, suited up in a hard hat and pr proper protective gear. And we dug a little trench and we hit the foundation of the building underneath a lot of fill. So we were able to say that it's where it should be. Uh, it's on their property. They were nervous that it might have been blasted by this modern industrial building. Uh, but it's it's going to be a hard site to study. We also dug shovel tests behind the Lazaretto, so this is the water side, and then we started putting excavation units in, and these were much more interesting. So much of the yard, and here's that enormous firehouse I mentioned, much of the yard is actually paved, so there's beautiful herringbone brick paving, uh, and that is sort of late 19th century, and it actually seals in earlier archaeological deposits. Here's some student archaeologists clearing that off. Uh, Matt Lobiondo, John Dysart, and Casey Hanna. Here's some of that paving, looks great. And um, we opened up a series of excavation units back here. And once we got a little bit deeper, they proved to be uh, pretty interesting. And more of that paving 
uh, but some features uh, showing up almost, almost you know, directly under it. Artifacts were interesting and they speak to the whole time period that the Lazarus was occupied. This is one of our favorite uh, finds. It's obviously a button uh, marked with uh, letter A and the number one. Uh, it has nothing to do with the steak sauce. Uh, instead, it's the first Philadelphia artillery. And this is uh, a unit that uh, was active during the War of 1812. And subsequently, we found some evidence that during the War of 1812, uh, soldiers would be mustered at the Lazaretto and then sent off to other places from the Lazaretto. So pretty cool find. Uh, here we are excavating near a big bulkhead doorway. One other thing we found, and I don't have pictures of these, a lot of airplane parts or what we think are airplane and boat parts from the 20th century. Here's some other early artifacts. Uh, these are fragments of redware. They're big, broad rims from chamber pots. So you can imagine if you have a lot of sick people staying in a hospital, uh, bathroom facilities, lavatory facilities would have been critical. This is a folding knife, probably very early 19th century, another nice button and some bottle glass, also from the first half of the 1800s. Uh, this is similar to what those chamber pot fragments would have come from. And here's a similar folding knife to give you an idea of what they would have looked like if they were intact. The stratigraphy was deep, so we had many different layers of soil. And uh, you get down to natural soils uh, really about three feet down. And uh, there's tremendous, we did not find a lot of Native American artifacts, but I think there's tremendous potential for intact Native American deposits on this site. The Lenape were certainly living uh, right in this area. There were a substantial number of tobacco pipe fragments from our excavations. And today uh, we would recognize smoking as problematic from a health perspective. Uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, there was a lot of debate on that. Uh, folks actually thought that smoking could dry out the lungs and uh, improve lung function in some cases. So that may be what we're seeing here. Uh, we have a revenue marine button down here, a small a gun flint heavily used here in a fragment of a redware pan. The key to the Lazaretto, perhaps, uh, came out of one of the excavation units, and there's a close up on that button. Now, this was our favorite, uh, our favorite find, I have to say, and uh, led to a lot of discussion. So, I initially identified this as. Uh, an apothecary's weight. And I thought that's super cool. Here's an apothecary's weight at a hospital. I've only read about these, I've never found one. And, uh, and I was wrong. Uh, it was exciting while it lasted, but I was wrong. Uh, ultimately, we put the picture on Facebook and Facebook, the sort of Facebook hive mind is an incredible way to do research. And a number of folks, including uh, some good friends down uh, at Colonial Williamsburg said that, no, it's not, it's not an apothecary's weight, it's a money changer's weight. Um, so it's showing sort of shillings and pence, and you would use this as you're changing money. So think about flying into an airport, maybe Montego Bay in Jamaica, and you want to change your dollars into Jamaican dollars. Uh, you go to Cambio, uh, and they measure out, you know, they count out what you have, and then they give you uh, new money in exchange. So that's what's happening here at the Lazaretto, and that fits really nicely with the sorts of activities we know went on here. This photo is a little bit fuzzy, I'm sorry about that, uh, but you can see we had a number of medicine vials, small bottles for medicine, and again, more tobacco pipes and more buttons. We did have, a, I'd say, a substantial number of buttons, and I think what's happening there is uh, when people are quarantined, uh, if they're quite ill, their clothes are being uh, incinerated and they're being given new clothes while they stay in the Lazaretto. Here again is some bottle glass, flower pots. And I know, you know, we've all seen flower pots. Photos from the late 19th century of the Lazaretto show that there were extensive gardens around the Lazaretto. And those may in part have served to, you know, make it smell better and also perhaps to provide uh, medicinal plants for people who were being treated uh, in the Lazaretto. And then this little piece down at the bottom is also really exciting because it's a tiny fragment of coral. And um, that, so coral does obviously not, there's no naturally occurring coral in the Delaware Valley, 
so uh, this speaks to trade with warmer climates, uh, whether the South Atlantic or the Caribbean. Now, after Monmouth did its project, a major restoration uh, effort uh, began at the Lazaretto, and and thank goodness because uh, they they really they really needed it. That project was carried out by a leading cultural resource management firm, Hunter Research, out of Trenton, and um, extensive excavations were carried out inside the building. Some of those were carried out. Uh, really almost a salvage excavations in an attempt to retrieve any artifacts from areas of uh, soil that had been really quite quite messed up. Uh, so here you see sort of the raw artifacts as they, as they were found, uh, lots and lots of bottles. And here you see cleaned up uh, and cataloged uh, some of those same bottles. Now these seem to reflect a different period in the Lazaretto's history. Most of our artifacts, I would say, are first half of the 19th century, even first third. Uh, the artifacts recovered by Hunter Research are mostly sort of mid-19th century, 1850s, on through the end of the century. Uh, and not only do they have medicine bottles, uh, but they also have ink bottles, they have uh, food or, and condiment bottles, they have beverage bottles. Uh, here's the Maltine Company. A chemist New York. So uh, a medicine. This is a great find, again, by the folks at Hunter Research. Uh, an ink bottle, stoneware ink bottle, intact, and it actually had uh, the handle of a pen inside it when it was recovered. So that's pretty cool. And you can imagine a hospital in the 19th century, just like a hospital today, there would be lots of record keeping going on. And this speaks to those activities. Uh, there are also uh, later 19th century bottles, and I don't know if these could be associated with the Lazaretto proper or with that uh, club that came in later, the Orchard Club. These appear to be uh, brandy or uh, some sort of alcoholic beverage bottles from the late 19th century. That one still has a little bit of foil wrapping. And, and other bottles, uh, including things that would look like uh, olive oil uh, and, uh, and imported bottles from, from Europe. There's some evidence for stemware too. So, uh, and this could again relate to the Lazaretto period because with a quarantine hospital like this, uh, people like perhaps those Ganges survivors would have been brought here who would have uh, really had no possessions or very few possessions. But you'd also have very wealthy people who, uh, who had become ill on their voyages and, and they would have been uh, quarantined. Here. And they may have expected to be treated a certain way and may have been afforded uh, opportunities to eat better, to drink alcoholic beverages. This is also a piece of stem from an alcoholic beverage, from a wine glass. Uh, contrasting some of the earlier and some of the later ceramics. These are banded wares. Uh, banded wares are really interesting. It's sometimes called moco or common cable. Uh, in the Caribbean, in the early 19th century, these are the most common wares. Uh, whether you're in Barbados, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and uh, they're very popular on sites where enslaved people live. And folks have argued, Paul Farnsworth, Lori Wilkie, and others, that this may relate to the color palette that is perhaps reminiscent of uh, pattern seen in cloth in West Africa. We can't say for sure, but there's definitely a, a prevalence of these ceramics. Uh, so we found some of these at the Lazaretto. By the late 19th century, we have really industrial wares, uh, almost like sort of diner or institutionalized uh, institution wares, very simple, uh, minimal expense. Uh, here, here are some of those pieces. And uh, these again were recovered by the Hunter Research archeologists. All right, so let me bring it all back together, uh, if, if I may. So archeology span at the Lazaretto uh, could be seen as taking sort of two different forms. One is above ground and one is below ground. The finds below ground provide some interesting information, right? There's practical information about where the quarantine master's house was, how, uh, how the porches uh, were arranged. There are also interesting deposits immediately behind the building um, that speak to 19th century medical practices, uh, the presence of military personnel on the site, trade with the Caribbean, and possibly um, 
the incineration or at least uh, the washing of clothes because you do again have lots of uh, lots of buttons. And we have that money changers way too that speaks to changing money as people came in uh, to the Port of Philadelphia. Hunter researcher Hunter researches uh, archaeological finds inside the building sort of speak to different a different time period. Uh, we get evidence for the sorts of uh, beverages and medicines being used at the site. We see that the city of Philadelphia is not expending a lot of extra money on ceramics when they're outfitting the Lazaretto. Those are, those are pretty low budget ceramics uh, that they're setting the table with there in the later 19th century. The above ground archeology span also tells us something. So in this picture, again, we see a guardhouse, we see the Lazaretto proper, and then believe it or not, this is that, uh, there's the physician's house. This is a World War I era airplane hangar that still survives, kind of amazing. Here's a modern seaplane. Um, the building itself uh, speaks to sort of rationality, balance. It is a big, beautiful, impressive building. And uh, what I would have you think about is really the panic and the mayhem wrought by the yellow fever, how people are, are very scared and with good reason. And this building I think is supposed to, in a sense, reinstill confidence, say, Philadelphia, we have this under control as a city. Uh, we have a fine hospital where people can be quarantined. It is beautifully appointed. Uh, it is staffed by really competent individuals. We're taking steps uh, to protect the city. So while well, Philadelphia is a city that is full of historic sites, the stories told by the Lazaretto are particularly uh, resonant today in an age where questions about disease, public health, immigration, pandemics, all, uh, all are of interest that are being experienced by us right now. And then I'd say in a bigger sense, they excite the public imagination. And they certainly shape the world we live in. So thank you so much for having me today as a speaker in the Archaeological Society of New Jersey's uh, speaker series. It was uh, a pleasure sharing with you. And if you have any questions, uh, I will try, try my best to answer them. Thanks again.